Hello, everyone. Welcome to Edit Together, collaborative editing for everyone. I'm George Demet, uh, founder and co-CEO at Palantir.net, and I'm uh, here with uh, Tanya Nascimento and Alex Jones, and uh, we're here to obviously talk about uh, Edit Together. If you were um, at our session yesterday, we're going to um, go into a little bit more detail about the origins of Edit Together, the kind of the business case that it was uh, built for. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the technical architecture, some of the uh, security considerations, uh, and then also, which was covered in yesterday's session, we'll talk a little bit about the community impact and what's next. If you were not at yesterday's session, that's also okay. Uh, we uh, will be providing enough context and introduction and some pretty video demos so that you will get a sense for what it is that we're building. So, um, yeah, uh, so, so yeah, so we'll start out, uh, Tanya will be talking first, then we'll have Alex and we'll come back, we'll have a Q&A portion at the end, uh, so kind of with like, hold your questions. And uh, so we will have both the opportunity for people to kind of raise their hand and ask questions in the room. And we will also have a link where people can submit questions anonymously. All right. So without further ado, I'm going to get, invite Tanya up here. Thanks, George. Um, so to start this discussion, I'd like to give some context just around the origins of Edit Together. Um, it's always easier to understand a solution when you understand the problems that it was trying to solve for. Uh, so let's dig into what prompted um, the creation of this solution. First, um, we'll talk a little bit about our client. Uh, it was a division of a state agency that uh, serves residents who are in need of Medicaid services, so think uh, elderly, disabled, low-income state residents are their primary um, targets there. And the team members within this division draft, edit, approve, and uh, publish content, for primarily for benefit enrollment, but lots of other things. But just looking at this snapshot, you can already get a sense of the importance of this work. This is vital work for folks in this state um, each day to have access to this content. And it's work that, although it's being done in this state agency, you might realize is also being done in agencies like this all across the United States. So let's get into the problem state, which is the current workflow. Um, what you'll see here is they use multiple different systems. This feels pretty uh, simple at first. They create in Word. Um, editing happens here in this one platform, but Versioning and publishing happens in another, in Adobe RoboHelp. And they utilize multiple versions of RoboHelp um, because of the high effort involved in moving existing publications to the current version. Additionally, the RoboHelp files are restrictive in the sense that uh, not everyone can edit directly in them or even see them at times. So hence we have this manual transition happening where editors are bouncing back and forth uh, between the two platforms. Then when it comes to publishing, it continues to be a manual process. Um, so they have a few options. They can export a PDF and publish to another site, like upload to a CMS. Uh, they can export HTML and uh, upload it to a server via SFTP, or they can email text. But once again, that's even manual because they have to manually format that email content. All the while, they have SharePoint kind of underpinning this entire uh, editorial process from end to end. And not to mention they also use other trackers that I just haven't included here for some tasks. So it's easy to see that they have a um, system that is completely manual and reliant on many, many platforms. Uh, you can see the complexity within this and that it's relying on licensing. So let's take a look at the life cycle of just a piece of content. So thinking about what we just saw, they have to take a piece of content through many phases to get it from ideation to publication. 
they go through an extensive drafting process before it can be approved and published. First, they'll start with a planning meeting where they'll have uh, multiple stakeholders and uh, required subject matter experts there. They'll draft the content, outline it, and then they'll have a kickoff meeting, at which point the initial draft will be reviewed and edited again. And you'll see that we have a work group that is working to ensure that that content is up to the standard that they need it to be, because accuracy is incredibly important in this field. So that content, that one piece of content, might cycle back through that edit process several times. If you think back to the previous slide, you start to understand why they're transitioning from platform to platform, and you can start to envision the ways in which even a very simple edit of a minuscule change becomes incredibly clunky and uh, it requires a lot of human hours. They then complete the process by uh, c uh, having a walkthrough review, and uh, once the content is approved, they can go ahead and publish it. This applies to four user guides, five handbooks, four manuals, and two point-in-time uh, publications that I haven't included here. So some of these publications have cycles that are more than three times per year. And the process can take several months for just one single piece of content. So looking back at this uh, workflow, if you start to add in these guides and handbooks and publications, you start to realize that it is incredibly burdensome. Think about one piece of content, not just four guides or five, one guide taking several months to go back and forth, back and forth, and then cycle all the way through this process. It starts to feel archaic, even though we are in the 21st century using 21st century uh, tools. And don't get me wrong, this organization is doing the most that they could do with the tools that they have. Um, they're actually creating a very creative solution with what they have at their disposal to meet their needs. But as we know, sometimes in government it can be hard to obtain funding and um, updates are needed. The impacts of this workflow are friction and inefficiency. So I've talked a lot about the high administrative burden. This fully manual process um, across multiple system relies on hundreds of uh, human hours which licensing fees aside becomes very costly. Each manual transition also introduces friction and an opportunity for error. So editors and subject matter experts create a bunch of systems and meetings to focus on getting these steps right because as I mentioned, it's important to have accuracy in this content, but all of that focus takes away from them being able to focus more time on their specific areas of expertise. We also heard from our client that they lack meaningful insight into usage by end users. So the current system does not give them an adequate look into how it's used. So it remains unclear for those users if the high amount of effort that has been put into the system is actually having the impact that they're intending for it to have. Um, additionally, adding any new handbooks or manuals uh, compromises the speed of the workflow. It makes it difficult to support new content and especially difficult to collaborate with new teams and subject matter experts. And this team is working with other agencies outside of their agency. The platform also has an inability to expand and adapt. Uh, they can't expand for multimedia, accessibility, content sharing. Uh, they can't add new functionality across documents because some functionality is only available for some content and everything is moving forward independently. So this type of workflow actually might feel familiar for many different uh, state agencies across the United States who are doing similar work with similar restrictions in similar platforms where they've piecemealed together a working system but it doesn't uh, have the sustainability that is needed. So this is where our team comes in. And uh, we have a team of 14 plus dedicated team members, not all pictured here, who have been working on this solution for the last year plus, and it's made up of several developers, engineers, a few technical architects, a couple strategists, a designer, product owner, a team lead, not to mention agile coach and some delivery managers who have been supporting this effort. 
And this team dug into the discovery of everything that I just mentioned, all the challenges that this agency is going through, uh, to come up with a solution where our client could create, manage, and publish all in one place. And that brings us to the replacement workflow, where we are hoping they can create in Drupal, manage in Drupal, and publish in Drupal. And this is a robust solution built in open source uh, software and integrated with the client's platform. So that makes it extensible. It is an adjustable system that's adapted to their needs. And it's intended to be built in a way where features added to one document or one book are available to all of it. So instead of everything moving in piecemeal, everything moves forward together. Not only does this increase efficiency in their workflow, but it re reduces the opportunities for error. You can see the massive reduction in the manual handoffs present in this workflow and reduction in the platforms that are being used. So while this provides ongoing benefits of open source, there is the additional benefit of no vendor lock-in or ongoing licensing fees, and it opens up a world where they can continuously improve their workflow going forward. They are put into the driver's seat and they have control. Um, they can create a much more sustainable system for content development. So it's really bringing them forward. Um, and these consolidated workflows reduce manual processing, administrative burden, and the total cost of ownership. So to get into the really interesting part that I know you all want to hear about, which is Edit Together, I'm gonna pass it over to my colleague, Alex. All right, uh, thank you, Tanya. Um, yeah, so uh, as um, I'm sure all of you who are passionate about uh, Drupal and content workflows and things like that uh, have seen, um, we can really consolidate something like that into a streamlined Drupal workflow. So what we did was we considered uh, kind of some some high level requirements that we were seeing out of, uh, out of what we might do with this work. Um, so we saw that we needed to move an existing workflow into Drupal 10 and that workflow had a lot of intense approval processes. Um, we had to find a solution for collaborative editing uh, because their workflow starts in Microsoft Office 365. Um, and we also had to have a solution for change tracking and comments and inline suggestions. Um, and we also had to uh, consider security in, in any solution that we came up with. Um, so our client has strict limitations on where content can be hosted, um, as do many government clients. Uh, so we had to take that into account with what we developed. So um, in this process, we explored a variety of solutions. Um, luckily, on the uh, workflow side, uh, Drupal really has all we need for um, for, for the workflow pieces for this client. Um, so we could satisfy all of those needs by finding existing modules. Um, and then for uh, collaborative editing and security, um, we investigated a few different solutions. Uh, we looked at Microsoft Office 365, uh, and the problem there obviously is that in using that, we can't bring the workflow entirely into Drupal. Um, and then we also looked at CK Editor 5, um, and uh, the, the problem there is, is the client server model that CK Editor 5 uses. That's a security limitation for our client. Um, so essentially we were stuck either having a, uh, a Drupal workflow that wasn't a, a full Drupal workflow with Office 365 or this security limitation with CK Editor 5. So instead, uh, we ended up with Edit Together. So um, in this section I'll kind of talk about uh, the technology um, in Edit Together uh, and, and how we've uh, developed it. Um, the, the specific uh, security um, implications that, uh, that Edit Together has and, and what it, um, how it secures uh, your content workflow. Um, and then uh, the community impact that we hope to have um, moving forward. Um, so I'll give a quick overview of what Edit Together is. Um, so Edit Together is a real-time collaboration framework for Drupal 10. Um, it does offer a modular and extensible rich text editor, uh, but it also offers um, collaboration at the form level. So um, we will have commenting, inline suggestions and change tracking, uh, media library and entity browser support in the text editor itself, um, integrations with Drupal content uh, moderation workflows and user access controls, and then obviously this real-time collaboration at the form element level. Uh, and what I mean by the form element level is uh, on your Drupal forms when you see um, 
a plain text field or a formatted text field or when you see checkboxes or radio buttons. Uh, we can consider all of those things form elements uh, and they'll, um, you know, uh, one or many form elements can make up a field. Uh, if we target that form element level, that means anywhere that the form element shows up in Drupal, we can sync it collaboratively and in real time. Um, so before I do any more talking about Edit Together, uh, we'll just do a quick video on uh, what it actually does um, so that you all have an idea of um, what the experience would be like using this tool. So um, I'll go ahead and play this uh, if I can get my cursor there. Okay, and so you can see um, I'm logged in as uh, myself over on the left, I'm logged in as Tanya on the right, um, and this is showing off that form level real-time collaboration. So we have uh, us editing on the title field, the subtitle field. Um, we can also edit the metadata um, on, the, uh, on the right there. Um, it tracks things like checkboxes, it tracks cursor positions, um, it allows you to add comments to, uh, to your body field. Um, and uh, presumably you would also be able to add comments to any other uh, form element in the future. Um, and uh, yeah, um, this, is, uh, this is kind of the experience that you can expect um, at the form level. Um, and, and the idea, again, with, with the form elements is that you can have this sort of experience anywhere that you see a form in Drupal. So that means node edit forms, it means taxonomy terms, views, anything like that. Um, as long as we have bindings for the specific form elements that are being used in those fields, we can sync them collaboratively between users. Um, so I'll go ahead and move on here. Uh, well. So I'll back over to this side. Sorry, I've, uh, I've, I've totally video, lost video, my cursor here. Video is so <laughs> much fun. All right, so. Well, that's our video again. There we are. Ah, perfect, okay. So um, we'll go over some of the technologies uh, that, that we've used to uh, develop Edit Together. Um, we've obviously used the Drupal Text Editor API, um, which uh, allows us to actually attach uh, Text Editor to, um, to Drupal. Uh, then we've also used ProseMirror, um, YJS and WebRTC, which is Web Real-Time Communication. Um, so just with the Drupal Text Editor API, um, this is kind of what your, uh, your node edit page looks like. So we've got the title field, the subtitle field, and then our body field, which is a formatted text field, um, does not have any editor attached. So when you, uh, when you don't have any editor attached to your text editor API, you just get a text area element in Drupal. Um, but what the editor API does is it provides a plugin system for us to attach text editors um, and it also provides a config entity for configuring them. Uh, and that config entity is what eventually becomes uh, the, the text formats that you see in Drupal, like your basic HTML, restricted HTML, full HTML, things like that. Um, so uh, we have the text editor API and we moved on to uh, ProseMirror, which is a toolkit for building rich text editors. Uh, and it's, it's very flexible, um, so you can, uh, you can use it in all sorts of different contexts. Um, but this is what we end up with after um, implementing ProseMirror and, and wiring it up to the text editor API. Um, so uh, this is just a, a rather simple um, implementation of Edit Together's text editor. It's got some, some text options, some bold, italic, underline, things like that. Um, but uh, the important thing is that ProseMirror actually allows us to instantiate configurable uh, text editors and we can um, configure them for specific contexts um, and uh, specific content types. So um, you can have text editors that have very limited options, you can have text editors that have a plethora of options, um, and you can configure them dynamically. Um, to actually get the collaboration piece working with ProseMirror, uh, we're using a tool called YJS, which is a shared editing framework uh, in JavaScript that syncs common data structures. Uh, so for um, any developers in here, that's just, uh, you know, it can sync like hash maps, and it can sync arrays, and it can sync uh, XML content and things like that, but it'll do it in real time uh, collaboratively with other people. So uh, what you can do is you can hook YJS up to ProseMirror, um, and you can sync ProseMirror's state between a bunch of different users. Um, and when you do that, you get this ability to see cursor positions with, uh, with your fellow um, content editors, and you can actually edit in real time. Um, 
and, and it uh, additionally provides this YJS document that actually allows you to insert multiple fields um, into a single collaborative session. So you can have a, a theoretically unlimited amount of um, fields tracked collaboratively in your document at one time. Um, so one thing that, uh, that we've um, discussed a lot over the past year, uh, just um, at various times, is why do we need to use both of these? Uh, so, you know, YJS can, uh, can, track, um, can track states. Uh, do we need to also use ProseMirror? Um, and the, the thing that ProseMirror offers us is a text editor that, that converts HTML structure to a common data structure that we can actually process with YJS. So what that means is those, um, I'll go back a page here, this title field and this subtitle field here, they look like traditional input elements that you would expect from Drupal but they're both actually ProseMirror instances. They have the same styling as the, uh, as the form elements from, from Drupal, but they allow us to process the positions of user cursors in them, and that's how we can collaborate on not just the body field, but the title and the subtitle field as well. Um, uh, and then YJS, obviously, um, we need to do any of this collaboration um, and any of this collaborative syncing, but with ProseMirror and YJS both, we can extend collaboration from beyond just the body field to the form element level um, and actually have collaboration across every form element um, on, your, uh, on whatever you're trying to edit. Um, and here's an example of that here. So this is um, you know, what you might have if you're just, uh, if you're just collaborating on the body, uh, on the body field. Um, and when we can implement ProseMirror and YJS and, and do field bindings for, um, for all the other form elements on this page, you get something like that. So you actually have the ability to, to collaboratively edit across your entire form. Um, so there were a few uh, barriers um, for this Drupal-based collaboration when it came to how we were actually gonna connect users. Um, so the, uh, the problem being there are, there are a couple different implementations of, uh, of collaborative communication. Um, you can use a WebSocket client server based communication or you can use a WebRTC peer to peer communication. Um, and uh, so in, in looking into those two options, we, um, we investigated their security, reliability and, and cost. Um, uh, and this is what we ended up with. So with collaboration via WebSocket, um, we, uh, here's a, Here's a graphic of, of it. Uh, so you basically have your, your clients who are collaborating and they reach out to a cloud service um, and they send their content state to that cloud service. So what that means is that the cloud service actually controls the state of the, um, of the content that you're collaborating on. So if you're collaborating on a body field in Drupal um, and you're using a WebSocket client server model, uh, that body field content is actually being stored in the cloud um, and its, uh, its state changes are um, are, are being affected by the other clients. Um, it is reliable and it's the existing, uh, it, it's the most common implementation of real-time collaboration, um, but security-wise, it is somewhat of an issue for, um, for our client and, and clients like ours, government clients, higher ed, healthcare, things like that, because your content state is exposed to and managed by a third party. Um, and even if that third party has, um, I, there are just a lot of a lot of implications with having having a third party manage your content in Drupal, especially since that's not something that we expect from Drupal. Um, the uh, cost is the other thing about um, WebSocket models. Uh, so because the the server is managing um, your your content state, they're also managing all the document changes that happen as you um, as you make changes collaboratively, and that is really CPU intensive. So you have to pay for a lot of server. Um, you, you got to have a lot of server processing power for that. Um, so then we moved on to WebRTC, um, which is a peer-to-peer -peer model, and here's a graphic of that. Um, you still do have a third-party service that you reach out to. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be third-party. It can be something that you host, um, but you only pass it your connection info, and that service exists just to connect clients with other clients. So. If, if this first client up here reaches out to the, to the infrastructure and the second client reaches out, they'll pass their connection info, they'll exchange connection info, and then they will actually form a peer-to-peer -peer connection where they pass their content between themselves. Uh, excuse me just a moment. 
So what's significant about that is that all of your content is only shared between people who are collaborating. So it's only shared between people who can actually edit the node edit form or the other content entity that you're collaborating on or your taxonomy term. So your, your content never leaves the, the stewardship of, of the people who can already access your site. Um, for security reasons, that's much more preferable um, for us than WebSockets because there's an, there isn't a third party that, uh, that can view your content. Um, and for cost, uh, all of that, um, that intensive CPU power that's required for the web uh, socket model is actually deferred to each client machine when you're editing via WebRTC. So the clients and, uh, are, are actually responsible for managing the state of the document, which means WebSocket is significantly cheaper than, uh, or I'm sorry, WebRTC is significantly cheaper than WebSockets. And we're talking like orders of magnitude cheaper than WebSockets. Um, so uh, yeah, we, we ended up with WebRTC um, and, uh, and with a peer-to-peer -peer collaboration implementation. Um, and now we'll uh, go through and talk about some of the other architectural features um, with Edit Together uh, that we've implemented um, to improve uh, development processes and things like that. Um, so the first and perhaps most important um, architectural feature of Edit Together is its plugin system. Um, it's somewhat familiar to CK Editor 5's plugin system, if any of you are familiar with that. Um, but it allows for granular control over all aspects of Edit Together without having to edit the Edit Together source code. Um, so what that means is that developers can extend Edit Together using custom modules, and they don't have to, they don't have to contribute to the base module to do so. Um, those contributions, uh, or sorry, those extensions can include things like toolbar buttons and functionality. Uh, they can include Prosmere plugins, um, which are plugins specific to Prosmere that allow you to do various things. Um, they can also include major features for Edit Together. Um, and I have these three listed here because in our implementation of Edit Together, we've actually implemented all of the features as plugins. So all of our toolbar buttons and functionality are in, an, in a module external to the Edit Together core module. Um, as are uh, many of the Prosmere plugins we use and the major features. So um, commenting and change tracking are both uh, extensions to Edit Together's core package um, and uh, other features of that magnitude can also be created um, for Edit Together without having to edit the Edit Together code base. Um, another uh, architectural feature we have is the auto-saving um, and uh, YJS document revisions. Um, We'll start with the auto-saving and then I can go over the uh, revision part, but um, the important piece is that uh, Edit Together has an auto-saving feature. Uh, it auto-saves in real time um, based, on a, uh, based on a timeout that you set. Um, and those uh, auto-saves are stored in fields attached to each collaborative entity that you specify. So um, it, essentially what that means is that auto-saving happens independently from saving a node. Um, so you don't have to actually press save on a, uh, on a node edit form to see those changes um, stored in the database, but you also don't have to expect that your content uh, that you've just typed in is going like, to show up when you go to the view page. So essentially, um, your, your YJS document revisions get attached to, uh, to each node, um, and then uh, as you save them, um, or I'm sorry, as the auto saves are made, uh, you, you don't have to press that save button. You can leave the page and come back to the page and expect that your content is still there. Um, it also, uh, by, by doing so, by attaching that YJS document um, to the entity that we're collaborating on, we're also um, allowing uh, the ability to, to track changes in a granular way. So you can track who made a change, what time the change was made at, what the change was, um, and uh, do that all in between revision one and two or you know, between any number of revisions you specify. Um, the third uh, architectural feature that's significant about Edit Together is the form element bindings. Um, so in a sense, we can consider the, uh, the actual text editor that, that ships with Edit Together to be one of these form element bindings. It just, for, it just binds to form elements that are controlled by the text editor API. But in order to get those other form elements um, to be collaborative, uh, Edit Together provides uh, basically its own API um, for uh, creating bindings for different elements. So the title and subtitle field that you saw um, that, were, uh, that people were editing collaboratively, um, that's a plain text YJS field binding. 
Um, and then the checkboxes that you saw are also um, YJS field bindings for checkboxes um, and uh, things like that. So what that means is that as we continue to expand edit together, um, we can take a granular approach to targeting specific form elements. Um, and those form elements uh, can also be, uh, be, because we're targeting the form, uh, sorry, because we're targeting um, form elements themselves, it means that uh, both core and custom fields that use uh, those form elements um, can be collaborative. Uh, and it also means that we can expand collaboration to any form, not just content entities. Um, and lastly, uh, I'd like to talk about um, how the uh, WebRTC infrastructure works um, with hosting options. So uh, as you saw in that diagram, um, WebRTC uh, does require this signaling server infrastructure um, in, in the cloud, which is a, a signaling server, a stun server, and a turn server. Um, and these are just three pieces of, uh, um, of server infrastructure that allow you to, to collaborate via WebRTC. Um, so there are actually some managed services that already exist um, for, uh, for this type of infrastructure, uh, but they have different requirements. Um, and uh, you know they require different keys, they require different author authorization uh, processes and things like that. Um, but using Edit Together, you can actually just create plugins to deal with any of those situations. So uh, currently we actually have plugins for, um, for enabling the default signaling server that ships with YJS, and we also have an Azure Web Hub Sub um, plugin. Uh, so what this really means is that as um, potentially more managed services become available, or if there's a service um, that you've already used that you want to use with Edit Together, all you have to do is, is write a plugin for it that, um, that passes to that managed service what the managed service expects. Um, but, but again, you don't have to edit the Edit Together uh, core um, code. So uh, we talked a little bit about security, um, but uh, just some additional security considerations. Um, this is perhaps the most important uh, thing about Edit Together, and this is also the shortest section, um, which is, I promise, a good thing. <laughs> so um, Edit Together prioritizes data sovereignty, um, and what that means is that uh, it, it ensures that your data is um, not only your responsibility, but that it doesn't go anywhere that you don't expect it to go. Um, and that's uh, a difficult thing to accomplish uh, these days, especially as, as things are incre increasingly managed um, via cloud services. Um, but WebRTC, uh, and you know, uh, Edit Together uses WebRTC, and WebRTC ensures that your content is only shared between the users that are collaborating. That means that no third parties have access to your content, um, and also, anyone can host the infrastructure to support collaboration. So you can use a managed service, you can host your own service on your own server. Someone else can host this WebRTC infrastructure. It doesn't matter who hosts it. WebRTC does not allow um, for uh, servers to, to basically view your content. Um, so Edit Together prioritizes data sovereignty in that way. Um, there is no way for a, uh, for a third party to view your content under any circumstances. Um, and what's really important about that for us is that WebRTC offers an option for collaboration for security conscious organizations where these WebSocket models are not really an option. Um, so there are, uh, you know, our client uses Office 365. There are many organizations out there that are security conscious that aren't able to use uh, Google Drive or Google Docs. Um, uh, perhaps some that might not be able to use Office 365, um, but you know all organizations that may benefit from collaboration, and this WebRTC um, solution offers them that access to this feature that they might not otherwise have. Um, so, in terms of community impact, uh, I've got um, a few different sections here: uh, the community impact for developers, uh, for content editors, and then for Drupal as a whole. Um, from a development perspective, uh, what we're hoping is that Edit Together's plugin architecture will allow people to rapidly develop new features for Edit Together. Uh, we're, we're hoping to lower the barrier to entry for actually developing features by not requiring um, people to contribute to the module. You can just create a custom module, uh, add, add the, um, the features that you want, uh, and then you know, have it running. 
Um, it also means that uh, there's a lower barrier to entry uh, for contribution, for module contributions, because as we build those custom modules um, and as they get more support, that might just be something easier to contribute back to the, uh, to the base module. Um, and uh, the plugin system, um, as we stated earlier, also enables collaboration to be expanded to other form elements. So as, um, as maybe new form elements are added or, or form elements uh, that are in the contrib space are, um, are increasingly necessary, um, we can expand collaboration to those form elements uh, easily and without having to contribute to the core code base. Um, for content editors, Edit Together enables real-time collaboration. Um, which is uh, a powerful tool um, in, uh, you know, when you're editing content. Um, it allows us to, to start thinking about how um, workflows might be uh, adapted to, to focus or um, at least use real-time collaboration. Um, and it, need, it eliminates the need to develop content outside of Drupal, which is a really big pain point for a lot of people to have to develop content in Google Drive or in Office 365 or, or somewhere else just to have access to collaboration. Now we can start that development of content in Drupal. Um, and then the impact for Drupal. Um, Edit Together provides a truly open source option for, uh, for a text editor in Drupal. Um, Pros Mirror is extensible. Uh, it's covered under the MIT license. Um, it, uh, it's fully open source and, and it's, uh, it, you know, it really slots into Drupal and allows us to, to create this plugin system where we can just rapidly deploy new features. Um, it also provides a flexible, uh, Edit Together provides a flexible framework for expanding real-time collaboration potentially to things beyond form elements. Uh, YJS is incredibly flexible um, and uh, as, as new collaborative functionality is discovered um, in Drupal, we can expand to, uh, to pull it into Edit Together. Um, and it would establish Drupal as the first CMS to really offer real-time collaboration in this way. Um, and that's what, we're, that's what we're hoping, is that this is, um, this is something the community wants and something that, um, that will benefit developers, content editors, benefit Drupal as a whole, and draw new people in um, to using uh, Drupal. Um, and uh, I will, uh, with that, pass it off to George. Thank you so much, Alex. So um, yeah, so we're going to get to Q&A here. Um, but before we uh, kind of did that, I want to talk about sort of like what our next steps are uh, with Edit Together. Uh, so one of the really key things about this project, um, one of the things from the very start was that we want to give this back to the community. We want other people to get involved. We want other people to build on uh, the work that's been done so far and to extend it and to really make this a community supported project. This is something that's not just important to us, it's also really important to our client as well. Uh, so at this point, um, what we're doing is we're asking folks to, to join us for a, a, a private beta period. Uh, and, and the reason we made that decision uh, to, to start off with a private uh, beta is that, you know, as I think Tanya very effectively, like, you know, communicated, like, we really built this around one client's use case. And as we've been working with Edit Together, we've really seen the potential for it to work with other use cases beyond the one that we've outlined. And so if what you've seen today feels like something that your company or your organization might want to get involved in helping to build, um, please uh, visit uh, edittogether.com. I think that URL should be working now. Thank, thank you, Byron. Uh, we had a little trouble earlier uh, for folks who may have tried to scan the QR code or visit the URL earlier. If you're still having any issues with it, DNS caching, whatever, you can also just go to our website at palantir.net and we got a big link on the home page for it. And so, yeah, so during this uh, period, what we're really looking to do uh, is really validate those use cases, um, really get some support for other use cases, um, and then also very much uh, focus on documentation, both uh, developer documentation and user documentation, so that when we get to the point where we're uh, able to release this, people can really get involved quickly uh, with it. And so what we're hoping, um, and again, this is like a, 
you know, maybe Q4 of this year, uh, we might be able to do a public re release, but that's really gonna depend on the amount of progress that's made during this uh, uh, private beta period. So, I think we have time for a few questions, and so, yeah, so you can either raise your hand and ask a question, uh, or if you want to ask a question anonymously, uh, you can go to Slido or scan the um, uh, QR code there. I'll be kind of tracking things as they come in. I already see some hands. I'm going to go to you right there, it's table two right in front of me, yes? That's a great question. So I'll repeat for the recording. Um, someone from a, uh, a federal client uh, who says that you know one of the barriers to using Edit Together uh, in their organization would be uh, that they might have uh, you know higher level people within the organization uh, who would really will be interested in having hands on the content, but but not necessarily wanting to be doing it through a web interface. Um, Tanya, I don't know, you might be able to have insight in this. I mean, I'm not aware of any of those kinds of issues with our client. Um, and yeah, you might just want to turn the mic on right there. Thank you. Yeah, we didn't run into that with um, our client. They uh, have a really robust, robust group of folks who are interested in helping out um, in that way. So that is an interesting consideration um, to think about. I'm trying to think about the ways in which we have various um, we have various ways of exporting the content, and I'm wondering if that would be a potential solution for a federal client like that, so that others could view that content without uh, feeling the need to enter into uh, the text editor, but I'm unsure if there might be other solutions. I think it's all possible within uh, what we're currently developing. Excellent. Um, I see um, lots of hands. I'm gonna go first, though, to one that was submitted via the Slido. Um, which has gotten a couple votes. Um, and Alex, I think you, you answered this one a little bit yesterday, but the question was, is this compatible with Layout Builder slash Paragraphs? Uh, if not, is that on the roadmap? But I think you have a very simple answer. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it is compatible with, with Paragraphs and Layout Builder. Um, so that compatibility um, extends uh, in Paragraphs. Um, you'll actually just be able to collaborate on, on your fields that are in your Paragraph, and then uh, your Paragraph field itself um, will update collaboratively as, as people add or remove um, different paragraphs. Uh, in Layout Builder, um, it currently works with inline blocks. Uh, when you're editing inline blocks in Layout Builder, um, we don't yet have uh, a, a solution where, where you actually like drag and drop um, in Layout Builder and that uh, collaboratively syncs with other users, but um, there is no technical limitation stopping us from doing that. Uh, Layout Builder is essentially um, a form uh, and um, we can sync those. We're already syncing forms using YJS. We just need to wire YJ up, uh, YJS up to handle um, the, the state that Layout Builder keeps, essentially. Awesome. All right. Way in the back there uh, to the right. Yep, you. Yeah, um, so, so that's uh, one of the, the challenges that we've encountered, and, and that's why we've built um, uh, extensions for, for certain things um, like the media library extension that we built or the entity browser extension, things like that. Um, the, the true limitation uh, to collaboration here is that um, ProseMirror uh, keeps a, a structured immutable state um, that uh, we don't have access to in CK Editor 5. So, so to edit um, on these uh, formatted text fields with a text editor, uh, we need to use ProseMirror. Um, in, in instances where you'd really need, um, like, 
basically CK editor 5 extensions that aren't provided by ProSmear, uh, you'd still need to use CK editor 5. Um, but uh, the idea is that with ProSmear being um, open source uh, and being uh, what we believe to be, you know, in line with, with um, with Drupal and, and Drupal's goals and things like that, um, we could hopefully expand ProSmear to um, cover most, if not all, of these um, these extensions. Right. And so, so Alex, a related, which I think you partially answered, question that uh, came in through the Slido: um, How well does this handle complicated forms, entity browser, inline entity form, conditional forms, etc.? Yeah, um, well, that's what's really cool, uh, is that conditional forms, uh, it, it handles conditional forms um, just the same way that conditional forms are handled now. Um, so uh, when, when YJS performs the syncing operation um, that syncs uh, two separate form states, it basically replicates the action that uh, the user that performed it, uh, it, it, it replicates that action on uh, the receiving user's uh, form. Um, so conditional forms work in the same way, complex forms um, work in the same way, uh, and then things like Entity Browser and things like that. Um, we, uh, I can't think of like um, a way that, that Entity Browser would, um, you know, if you're actually editing in Entity Browser um, or, or, or searching through an Entity Browser, how that would be like real-time collaborative, but the insertion process that happens afterwards would, would immediately update and, and show in your form collaboratively. Awesome. All right. I'm going to go with you. Yes? Uh, follow, following up to that, uh, what you just said, what about permissions? Because one of the tricky parts of workflows is maybe two different users have uh, editing permissions, permissions on a node, but inside that node there's a prompt and question field where one of the users has access and the other one doesn't. Uh, so how does the system handle that? So repeating for recording this question about how it handles permissions. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, my my understanding of, of like permissions, if you actually have like a field that's disabled um, for one user and and enabled for another, is that it would just remain disabled. Um, the we actually have a, a a permissioning circumstance with this current client where um, some users uh, can actually edit um, and others can only view the content, um, but they may be able to comment on it, which is kind of an interesting issue. Um, and uh, so. It, our, our thinking is that um, by exposing uh, permissions um, to edit together, basically exposing permissions to the JavaScript layer, um, you'll then have the, the granularity and control to, to basically do whatever you want with them. But, but for specifically for fields that are permissioned and, and some users have access to them and other users don't, uh, that wouldn't be overridden by edit together. The, that, that control would remain there. Awesome. All right, I'm going to answer one more question that came in online and then one more question from the room, and I think they kick us out. So. If you have more questions, I'm going to suggest you come by our booth, um, and we'll, we'll be there to answer them. Uh, so, uh, and so this is one actually I think I can answer. Uh, is there a maximum number of collaborators at once? Uh, in theory, uh, no. Uh, in practice, we are recommending no more than 20. Uh, so it just gets really unwieldy after that point. We'll take one more question from the audience. Yes, you on this front. Mm. So, so this is, yeah, the question was, what's the level of complexity involved if you want to run your own uh, WebRTC server? Uh, so the answer is, um, this is a non-technical answer, uh, but uh, my understanding is that it's, it's actually really super easy to spin up. Um, however, we don't yet have uh, the full documentation for that, and so that's one of the things that we're hoping folks will help us out during that private beta period. Awesome. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, once again, if you're interested in learning more, sign up at edittogether.com, stop by our booth, or follow us on the socials. Thank you.